is a machine, right? That's part of the, that is part of the introduction. I literally cannot believe, because I know the work you do. I know your schedule. I follow Greg on Instagram. I see every moment, not every moment, but a lot of moments that he's spending with his children. He has these two amazing daughters and this wonderful spouse. And I don't know how you did it. I really don't know how you did it. So let me, let me turn back time and tell you a little bit about Greg, although I'm sure a lot of you n know of his work. But you may not know of his attachment to this university. So um, Greg graduated from the University of Georgia in 2004. I was here, and he avoided all of my classes. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Broke my heart. Broke my heart. But I will tell you that the very first time I asked Greg to come speak to one of my classes, he was there in a second. And I have never seen another journalist or anyone in business or anything who has been as generous with his time as you have been Excuse back to this to come university. To Athens? Are you kidding? There you go. <laughs> so uh, Greg also has this amazing amount of work experience. I mean, after he left UGA, he did more internships than I think the entire applied politics uh, whole class has ever done, got a lot of experience. Um, the fifth one, as you said, was at the Associated Press. And I know that they were impressed with you. You went to work for the Daily Report, um, and then went back to the AP and worked there for seven years. And then I think um, he was very responsible for just the, the increased standard of, of, of uh, work that we see in journalism, if everybody were the journalists that you and Jim Galloway and, and, the, and the rest of the crew, Tamar, and uh, all of the AJC reporters were, we'd be in much better shape in this world. And, and we know a lot of that was learned here at the University of Georgia from great professors who are sitting here in this group. So with that, let me also tell you that this is a great book. And even though I know a ton about Georgia politics and politics in general, I couldn't put it down. I learned so much about it, and I wanted to um, thank you for writing it, because I'm going to assign it in class. <laughs> and it's I like think my bar stuff. Yes, <laughs> and I think Chuck Bullock will too. And you know, I will add one more thing in the introduction: is that you know we're so proud of you. I mean, do you get tired of hearing that? But I'm just going to say, I mean, I'm not like I'm you know old enough to be your mom, Greg, or anything like that. But you know, just as someone who comes from political science and from the School of Journalism, you are that wonderful alumni that we appreciate so much. So let me end that there and start asking questions. Jeez, yes, <laughs> but it's all true. So, you know, it's all true. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Of so let's, let's have at it, shall we say, and start this conversation so that we can let all of you be a part of that too. Yeah, keep some questions in mind too, because I can't wait to hear from you. And he has a million stories to tell, I tell you, and they're all good. So, um, so let's start at the beginning. And you know, I wanted to ask you if you've always wanted um, to take the front row seat that you have in Georgia politics and write a book about it. And specifically, can you tell us a little bit about how this book came to being? So I've always wanted to take the front row seat in politics but really started, okay, so in fourth grade, I was at the Hebrew Academy, and, um, and we had a special class where we brought in the bravest beat writer, I.J. Rosenberg. I don't know what he said, and I don't know what lessons he imparted, but I remember going home, and it was the bravest for, worst of first season. So I remember going home and telling my mom, I wanna be a reporter. And then she said, well, Greg, you have to learn how to type. I said, nah, I don't wanna be a reporter anymore. I wanna do something easier. So I decided to become a doctor. So for like the next eight years, I had this delusion that I was going to be going to medicine and science. And I was terrible. I was getting twos and AP physics class. I was just, it was not me. Um, and then it, when I was a sophomore in high school, or junior, junior in high school, my best friend Jessica Schiffman, her dad was a CNN producer. And it was 1998 and there was bombings in Kosovo. Was, we thought it would be what was happening right now. We thought the Russians were going to invade and it was going to be, you know, maybe the start of an international conflict. And it was all hands on deck at CNN. And her dad said, Jessica, Craig, do you want to go to CNN with me? We're, we're working, you know, 
it, it's, it's a crazy moment. Do you want to come with us? And Jessica kind of rolled her eyes like, Dad, leave us alone. And I said, no, let's do it. And whatever happened at the CNN that night, I don't know, I just watched. I just helped out and helped log video or something like that. But I just fell in love with journalism all over again. And I came back and I said, I'm going to work for the North Springs High School Oracle. And I was going to go to UGA and work for the Red and Black. And that was the, one of the first things I did when I got here was work for the Red and Black. It was a daily newspaper back then. And pretty much by the time I was a junior or sophomore or junior, it was kind of the way they had it was every day there was a slot on the front page that I had to fill something with. So I had to find a story every day, uh, whether it be about the SGA or student judiciary or crimes or courts or something. Um, and so that gave me a good grounding into what I do now, which is trying to find good stories to write. Um, and sometimes the stories at the Red and Black were not good, but it was a really good experience. Um, and I remember going, sitting in Charles Bullock's class, and Jim Galloway came in and, t and talked, and Jim Galloway is the former AJC columnist and a mentor of mine, and, and he's on the back of the book. Um, I, got, I was lucky enough to work with him for about a decade. Um, but Jim and Tom Baxter came to the class and started speaking. And it was one of those days where I had to fill something on the front page. And I, I can't find the clip, but I remember quoting them and uh, put them on the front page of the Red Black the next day, but then went home and told my now wife, but back then girlfriend, that I want to be them. I want to work with them one day. Um, and I was lucky enough to get to do it. And it's such a cool experience. Um, but I'd also say this, that the people in those classes, I remember in, the, in that Charles Bullock class, um, Chuck Efstration was one of the people in that class, and now he's a state representative. Um, Jared Thomas, who is the governor's uh, chief of staff, was in that class. Um, when I was the editor of the Red and Black, Latham Sadler was the SGA president. He's now running for U.S. Senate. Um, the SGA president of, before him was Sachin Varghese, who's now the Democratic Party's top lawyer. And the one before him is Adam Sparks, and he's also a top lawyer for the Democratic Party. So the people, Fink, Conrad Fink used to always say this to me, but Blue Steen, the people you're covering now, you're going to continue to cover. So don't, don't mess up. Um, and so he was right. You know, the, the reputations and, the, and the, the connections you make here today will follow you, um, especially if you stay in Georgia. But even if you don't, but especially if you stay in Georgia, um, because I still bump into classmates and sometimes have to cover them. And that maybe the biggest example of that was Jason Carter. Um, his, his wife, Kate Carter, was the ed editorial advisor at the Red and Black when I was the editor in chief. And so I disclosed all that to my editors, just saying, hey, you know, I didn't know Jason that well, but his wife, like we, I literally worked with her every single day when I was a senior at UGA um, because he ran for governor and I covered his campaign, you know, relentlessly, um, like all that. So I didn't think, I, I wanted to have this front row seat. I didn't think I'd get it, um, but I love it now that I do. And it's because it's, Georgia is more dynamic and interesting um, than ever. And it wasn't that way in 2014. In 2014, even in 2016, you know, I'd be at these press conferences and be the only reporter. Even in 2018, there were some times where I'd go to Stacey Abrams events and she'd joke like, hey, I might as well just do this in your office. Um, early in the campaign, not later. Later, it, it transformed, but earlier on in that campaign. And then as she became this national phenomenon, you know, suddenly, you know, I'd go to these press conferences and be 40 other reporters like, where were you? Who are you? <laughs> um, and now we are definitely in that. I mean, now the New York Times is hiring reporters to be based in Atlanta just to cover politics. Washington Post is. Um, the national media has woken up to the fact that Georgia is the best story in the nation, the premier battleground state, and the best test of Donald Trump's influence um, going forward is right here in Georgia. So, um, And to get to your question about writing a book, I never, I used to cover courts and cops too in, at the Associated Press, and I thought I would write a book about Troy Davis. I covered executions, and, I, and after the Troy Davis execution, it was an international story. I said, maybe I'll write a book about that. And then an agent told me, yeah, you kind of already have to have the manuscript done in order to pitch that book right now. It, it's, a, it's a long process. Um, so I kind of put it out of my mind. But an agent reached out to me in the middle of the November elections, right after 2020, and said, I think you got a book here, and I'll, I'll help you out with it in terms of writing the proposal, because I didn't know anything about that process. And I was in the middle of covering the biggest story of my life, so I didn't really have all that much time to write one. Um, and I thought about it, I talked to my wife about it, and I talked to my editors about it, I talked to some authors about it, and my wife basically said, you'll kill, you know, you'll, you'll be so mad at yourself if you don't go for it. Um, and I'm glad I did. And I spent nights and weekends doing that nine week runoff stretch in between covering the runoffs, working on a proposal that was way too, I ended up writing a 90 page book proposal. Um, and yeah, way too long, um, but we got it in front of the p potential publishers by January 1st, 
And um, of course, the runoff was January 5th, so it did not have an ending. We didn't know if, if Warnock or Ossoff would, would win or if the Republicans would hold those seats. But either way, I kind of wrote it as a cliffhanger. And so they saw it January 3rd when they came back from their vacations, wherever they go on vacation, because I didn't get one that year. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the insurrection happened you know, the day after the runoffs. And so a week after that was when um, we had the interviews. And most of the interviews were about you know, Georgia being this battleground state. Um, and a week after that was when I, I got the book contract. And then it was kind of like, good luck, go do your thing. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. Um, so I kind of freaked out for probably a week. Like, okay, because you, you have this image of, you know, this team of editors from New York descending on you and working with you on how to outline the, the, the book and what your first chapter is going to be and what your 17th chapter is going to be. And it's not like that at all. It's kind of like, hey, go do your thing, right? Um, and it took me about a week to realize that, and then I had a call with the editor who bought the book from Penguin Random House, Rick Cotton, he was great. And he said, look, we bought the book because we're confident in you. We bought the book because we like the proposal. Just follow the proposal. And so for the next few weeks and months, that's what I did. After work, uh, I would kind of go in the basement after the kids were asleep, after Maury was asleep, and work for three or four hours every night until one or two in the morning and get it done. Well, and, and I know you're not one to brag on yourself, but how many... Um, how many publishing houses were bidding on getting this book? I think it was seven, um, and there was like six like decent offers, um, you know, six offers. But I was fully prepared to go and, you know, kind of do it almost for free in my basement. I, just, I was telling my wife, I remember, I was like, I want this to happen. Um, so we have to make the, you know, we have to realize that it could just be a couple, you know, a couple thousand dollars maybe, you know, nothing to sneeze at, but um, it might not be something that, you know, is financially rewarding. Um, and because it's a weird, I don't know anything about this industry. I still don't know anything about this industry. I know the news industry, right? I know the media industry, but the book industry is something, compl it's an entirely different animal. And I think mentally it helped me with that because I didn't go in there with any sort of preconceived notions. I was just happy to get a single offer. I would have been just fine. Well, you know, and, and you, you say that, but I remember when I've been spending a lot of time with this book, I joked with uh, a friend of mine, I've had like almost every meal, and you can tell uh, with this book yeah, lately. It looks worn and tired. Yes. <laughs> and um, yes, so, but what amazed me is like the narrative. I mean, it, it, if, you, if any of you have already read the entire book, it is written so well, and the stories are, and the characters are so well developed, it's almost like you are reading a bit of a, of a, a cliffhanger and a story, and I couldn't put it down. But you know, I remember when you wrote the proposal. Did did you write it in, in an outline? Did you already know the story? Did, did did you have to fill in a lot of those gaps? Yeah. So I didn't know the ending, right? Yeah. Um, so that was the first big one. I had no idea. I really didn't. I mean, I didn't. And that's one of the things that you know you can get criticized for that too. Is that I'm not trying to make any predictions about what's going to happen in the future because I don't know what's going to happen in November. Right? Um, I could see Republicans winning all these seats and flipping back, um, at least the Senate seat, right? And keeping this, the governor's seat. Or I could see Democrats, um, you know, uh, growing on their gains. It's, we're months away from November, which is eons in the political world. Um, but in the proposal, yeah, I didn't, I, so there was a giant question mark at the end because we didn't know who was gonna win the Senate runoffs. But also throughout, there was just parts where it needed more reporting. And I, I interviewed hundreds of people for the book, went back, um, talk to, you know, sometimes I would talk to people for two hours and it'd be one line or even just a, a phrase in the book because it just didn't fit in. And sometimes I would have a 10 minute conversation and it would be enough for several pages. Um, especially when you talk to, you know, the principals, the main candidates who were sometimes harder than others um, to, to, to talk to. Where, did you find that some people who perhaps during regular reporting hours were a little bit more tight lipped found out when you were writing a book that? They, they were willing to share some more or stories about that. Yeah, and look, I mean, it's a whole different type of writing too, right? I am a deadline guy. You know, I wrote a story at the Blind Pig right before we got here about, about something that happened with David Perdue today. Um, so I'm used to, you know, writing on deadline, writing quickly, having that instant satisfaction of being able to have my story published and, and get out there. Um, working on a story for a couple weeks is hard, and working on a story for a couple months is really hard. And sometimes it's worth it, right? Like we, the AJC put together this really cool package. 
um, about the inside tr Trump's efforts to overturn the Georgia election that took months, and, and just yesterday it won the Toner Prize. So we were happy. Like it doesn't always happen like that, but sometimes you know it, it pays off in terms of readership, and you know and the, the brass likes awards, so it pays off with that too. But for the most part, I'm a you know deadline dude, and having to spend um, wait a year, 13 months for something that I'm working on to, to see the light of day has been a t different challenge, and writing it is a different challenge, right? The, um, Bill Nygut was doing an event a couple days ago, and he was making, he was talking about some of the adjectives that I could never have gotten in a newspaper article. My editors would take out those adjectives in a heartbeat, but I can get them in a book because they have a little bit more freedom to do that. And I know some people really like those adjectives. I remember uh, when the lieutenant governor was here, he was telling me about one of those adjectives. It was permatand. Permatand, <laughs> yes. So He does. He has a very nice glow. I wish I had it. Yes. Well, let me ask one more question about the book, kind of a tough question, and then we'll um, open it up to uh, the audience to, to take some time to ask some questions. So um, throughout the book you lay out background and facts about the pivotal players and let me tell you I learned so much about people and, and in some cases very moving material that was shared and some of them you handled very gently right so Brandon Phillips if you know anything about Georgia politics he, mm -hmm. there's a lot of good stories about him and I, I was thinking to myself boy you know a different kind of book could have taken some of these individuals and, you know, put out a lot of red meat, mm -hmm. but you handled them very factually, you know, without kind of, if they weren't a pivotal player, you didn't go into um, some of the things that could have changed the tone of the book or been very harsh. Um, even the harshest criticisms of Governor Kemp, for example, you laid out very matter-of-factly and, and, and then the story went on. And it felt in a way, as I was reading it, that you were allowing me the opportunity to make assessments myself without putting too much of your own assessment in there. And I appreciated that. Um, and the, the people in the book became very human. That's something that you don't always see in political science textbooks and a lot of books that are written like this. There are a lot of dimensions that I found to be unexpected, um, especially of the, the women in the book, the tragedies that Karen Handel and Lucy McBath and Stacey Evans and, and their background. A lot of people don't know that, and they often will treat politicians in a way without any consideration to the fact that they're human beings with these stories. So the question I wanted to ask you is, as you were writing this book, as you were learning even more about them than you already knew, and you, you, you know probably more than many people about most of the political actors in the state, was it hard to sometimes not perhaps um, treat some that you admired a lot uh, more positively and maybe those that were not as deserving of as admiration a little bit more negatively. It didn't feel like you did that in the book and I was going to ask you how did you manage that and do you, do you, did it take an effort to do that? Yeah, when we forget politicians are people um, and I did deliberately try to, you know, write about them with their faults and their and their issues, um, and also their, their, the positive side, right? I mean, you know, why they were doing what they were doing. I tried to get into their minds a little bit without trying to psychoanalyze. And really, that's because I'm a local reporter. I'm not coming in this from an outside perspective. I didn't parachute in from New York or Washington um, for a few months to write this. I have known Brian Kemp since 2002 when I covered a state senate campaign right here. Um, his campaign manager was the guy I was just talking about who was sitting right next to me in, in Charles Bullock's class, right? Which is the beauty of of being a student in politics, as you know, Professor Haynes, so many of your students, you can get involved in these campaigns really early on and not just play a minor role, but play a very pivotal role. Um, uh, but no, I've, I've covered um, Stacey Abrams since she was a, a backbench state lawmaker more than a decade ago when no one knew her name. Um, and I would bug her for quotes on legislation that was moving through that no one else was paying attention to. Um, I've known David Perdue since 2013 when he would be at these barbecues in the middle of nowhere, you know, small town Georgia, and no one would know who he was. I mean, you know, Nathan Deal would walk right by him, not as a snub, just he didn't know who David Perdue was. And I've known John Ossoff since 2017, January, a cold January morning when he called me out of the blue and he says, I'm this activist named John Ossoff, and I'm running for U.S. House, 
and I've got $250,000 and Hank Johnson and John Lewis's endorsement. Do you think that's worth a story? And I said, yes, it is. Um, not knowing he'd ever win, right? I didn't think, I still didn't think in the back of my mind he had a shot at, a, at that house race. I never imagined I'd be talking, calling him Senator John Ossoff now. Um, but you know, you get to know them over the years and you write about plenty of stories they hate over the years and there's plenty of things in the book they don't like. Trust me, I mean, I'm hearing it from, from them plenty right now. Um, but you also treat them as people because they are people. And um, what they're doing, I mean, part of the book is talking about why Kelly Leffler and David Perdue went so far to the right, why Kelly Leffler never was able to run the campaign she wanted to. Um, and, you know, it's not a, I'm not apologizing for it, but because of all these external factors and because of the fact that Doug Collins got in that race, she was never able to kind of run the campaign that she hoped to run that would appeal to moderate Republican women who had left the party because of Donald Trump. And that's just one example. Um, but, you know, and I benefited from being able to talk to those candidates about those things and being able to, you know, sometimes on background, sometimes on the record, but being able to say, hey, you know, did you, did you really call John Ossoff a little shit? Or, <laughs> or whatever it might be. Um, and to have that open conversation with, with candidates because I've, you know, they might not like what I write, but I've gotten to know them and they know I show up and they know I'm, I'm, I'm writing this book whether or not they're cooperating. Did that answer your question? Oh, it, it did. It certainly did. And we were, in fact, in class talking about some of these things that you talk about in the book. So I was also going to say, as a political scientist, I found a lot there that I could use myself. So I think you put both of your degrees uh, to work. I was a newspapers major back when there was one. Uh, now it's something much fancier. It's what, just journalism? <laughs> That's right. Well, let me do it's this. Yeah. The yeah. journalism. Yes. Yeah. The, yes. the journalism. Yes. Not just journalism. Yeah. Capital journalism. journalism. Ve a should... very important thing. Yes. So, um, so why don't we keep this pretty casual since we have a, a, a nice intimate group here. If you wouldn't mind, um, if you have a question, raise your hand and then we'll, uh, I'll call on you and then please share your name and ask your question. Okay. And Dan, I know you. So Dan, why don't you stand up and ask your um, question? Thanks for coming, Brian. I of was course. the campaign manager on the other side of that Brian camp. Oh, you were for, for Doug Haynes. Doug Haynes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to ask what was been a surprise for you in commerce this past weekend, Ooh, besides yeah. a small crowd. So <laughs> I was saying I was a little bit later than I expected um, this morning, just now, because um, Donald Trump just has sent a mass email attacking the AJC for um, reporting accurately the size of the crowd. Um, <laughs> I don't know why crowds become such an obsession, but um, look, I mean, I've been to literally dozens of his rallies, and um, it was, I'm used to 25,000 people. That was not 25,000 people. That was a much smaller crowd. And I just pointed that out on Twitter. Um, but also, it was a less enthusiastic crowd in general. I think that would, that would be my first answer to your question, other than the crowd side. Um, you know, the applause lines that I usually hear cheers for, I didn't hear them this time. It was more of a, um, they, the crowd got animated over culture war issues, you know, um, transgender athletes, um, you know, stuff like that. But also, whenever election fraud was invoked, right, whenever the, the, the big lie was invoked, that was what animated the crowd the most. And there was this, you know, when David Perdue was speaking, he talked about Rivian and his opposition to the Rivian $5 billion deal down the road. And there was literally like not a stir in the crowd. I mean, barely any applause whatsoever. He talked about Buckhead Cityhood, right, another part of his campaign. And the crowd barely even blinked an eye, right? You couldn't hear anything from the crowd. But then when he brought up holding, um, you know, holding Republicans accountable who didn't, uh, you know, do whatever he wanted, with, uh, reverse the election, whatever he was, whatever his dream was for the election outcome, that is when the crowd got energized and literally started chanting, lock him up in regards to Brian Kemp. Yeah. And that was the moment to me. I mean, that's the story I was just working on at the Blind Pig Tavern, um, was David Perdue's response to that. He said, hey, he, mis mis he misheard the crowd when they started chanting, lock him up. Um, but that to me was, it was not part of his script, right? Um, it was not part of his speech, but when the crowd started chanting, lock him up about a Republican governor, and he is encouraging them, he's clapping and giving them a thumbs up and egging them on in a sense. Um, that's a line that it's going to be really hard for whoever wins, if it's Kemp or if it's Purdue, because um, I don't know. Look, I know Kemp is ahead in the polls, but anything can happen. Um, but whoever ends up winning, it will be hard for the Republican Party, even harder now, to get back together after David Purdue was seen cheering a lock him up chant. 
um, even if he's saying he misheard it. Um, so that was another surprise. And really what I was really watching for were the down ticket candidates that Donald Trump just endorsed. I mean, people that, I'm in politics and I don't know who John Gordon is, right? I mean, I knew his name because I, I remember he, you know, ran for state senate in 2018 and lost in a, prim in a primary. Um, but what, seeing him in person, hearing the rhetoric from these down ticket candidates, Patrick Witt, who was running for Congress up here, um, switches at the last minute to run for insurance commissioner. And it's all because, I mean, there's no, there's, th there's no question about it. It's all because it's Trump trying to go after camp allies, right? Is, the insurance commissioner, John King, has done really nothing to upset the base. I mean, no one even, <laughs> the base doesn't know who John King is. Um, but because he's a Kemp appointee, the former president now is going after anyone in, in Brian Kemp's orbit. And I wanted to hear what Patrick Witt was saying. And, you know, to their credit, Patrick Witt and John Gordon both riled up the crowd. They both got really good applause. Um, John Gordon especially so. His first promise was to investigate the 2020 elections if he took office as Attorney General. And Patrick Witt said he was against woke insurance, whatever, whatever that is. Um, I don't know if John King can tell you what woke insurance is, but, um, but that, was, that was really the, the top things I was looking for. And, and when you go to a rally like that, we were talking about it earlier, you know you're giving up your day. You gotta get there like a one, you know, one or two. And, and so I wanna kinda make it worth it. So I interviewed a ton of voters. We, we got a lot of audio for the podcast that we put out this morning. Um, a lot of stuff for coverage in the newspaper, but also future coverage and things like that. So, um, uh, but it, it was a moment, right? It was a big moment in this campaign and I wouldn't be surprised if Donald Trump came back in May for, for David Perdue. Can I, can I put in a plug for the podcast? Yes. I really enjoy listening to it. I've listened to it since the very beginning yeah. when it started to now. It's called Politically Georgia. And it's a, it's a great, it, it, do you have to subscribe to the AJC? No, no it's free. It's free. It's, it's free. So, you know, it's a great resource if you enjoy Georgia politics. And I mean, it's how you really keep in the know about what's going on right now on the ground. And that's with me and the co-host Patricia Murphy. And we tape it twice a week. Sometimes we have guests, sometimes it's just us blathering about, about politics. Um, but there's so many issues to talk about and it's only gonna get busier. Um, and now we're starting, about to really start the campaign trail drive, even though it, it's already started, at the end of the legislative session. So we've got Sine Die coming up Monday with all sorts of legislative shenanigans and dramatics. Um, and so our next episode will be about that. Well, and I have to add too, um, when I first started directing um, Applied Politics in 2016, the first thing I had to do was buy a subscription to the AJC because I realized that's really the only way I could find out what was going on in Georgia politics. I'm just, I'm just paying her under the table for all this. <laughs> so, uh, more questions from the audience? There's, uh, introduce yourself to Hey there, uh, my name is Austin Clark. I'm a third year political science and public relations student. And uh, two images or two uh, commercials that I remember from 2020 yeah. are uh, Kelly Loeffler's Attila the Hun commercial and Warnock's with the, with the dog. Right? Yeah. Uh, what do those two commercials or the fact that, I've, that those are so memorable for me, what does that tell you about messaging for this year and the influence they had in 2020? First of all, that's a great question. First of all, $500 million was spent, half a billion was spent just on ads. So the fact that you actually remember two of them says a lot because it shows that those ads stuck out, right? They got free media too, people like me wrote about them. And I wrote about both those ads because I thought that they were both, you know, there's a reason they both stuck out. Um, Kelly Leffler's Attila the ad is in the book and so is the Alvin ad too that you mentioned. But it's in the book because to me that showed, that, that to me was the moment where it crystallized she could not be the candidate she wanted to be. And again, not apologizing for her at all because it is what it is. Um, but when Brian Kemp, you know, went to a point, was looking for someone to a point, he was looking for a few criteria, among them a running mate for himself, because he thought whoever he'd pick would win, and that he'd be able to run with them, with him or her, right now. Um, someone who is not the typical white dude who dominates Republican politics in Georgia. So either a woman, a person of color, so someone else. Um, someone who could appeal to the white college educated um, suburban women who had left the party, and it didn't necessarily have to be a woman, but he was, that was kind of the angle, and an outsider who would be pro-Trump. So those were some of the main criteria he was looking for, and he felt Kelly Leffler hit the, fit the bill, but from the very beginning, it was clear 
to people like me because Doug Collins called me. <laughs> I, was, I was with Kelly Leffler and the governor and all that when Johnny Isaacson announced um, he wasn't he, we're going to serve another term, that he was, he was stepping down, I should say. And, um, and the, like, within hours of that announcement, there was already open jockeying. I mean, Doug Collins was already calling me and other reporters saying, I want to be put in the list of people who are, who are contenders. He made it very clear that he wanted the job. Governor Kent made it very clear that he was not going to go with a traditional candidate, no matter what the pr outside pressure was. Um, and so the Attila the Hun ad, to me, crystallized how far she had to go to the right. She had to say, she, she couldn't give Doug Collins like any space at all to run to her right. And it got to the point where she said she was more conservative than Attila the Hun. Apparently it wasn't all that conservative when you look back at the warlords of that, of that era, but, <laughs> but I, we'll let a historian talk about that more. Um, but the, the Alvin ad was completely different because um, Raphael Warnock, in a sense, had to convince those white middle class suburban voters that he wasn't scary. I know that sounds weird. Um, and by doing that, he would walk around with a puffer vest and, and in, in, a, you know, in a leafy green neighborhood with this little cute dog. And like, very strange, but the dog actually kind of lived near me. And so I knew that wasn't his dog because I happened to see that dog a lot. Uh, without disclosing anything I'm not able to disclose, um, the, d the dog might have lived in my general zip code. And, <laughs> and so I knew it wasn't his dog, and I, didn't, I also didn't think it would be this big scandal that it wasn't his dog. And so later on, I would see these like conservative media write these stories about how like, Alvin wasn't really Raphael Warnock's dog, and I was like, it's not really that much of a secret. It's an act, you know. It's a, um, it's a stand-in, but the ads worked, right? Um, and I go extensively in the book about those ads um, because Adam Magnus was is the ad maker for Raphael Warnock, and um, that ad, just like the Attila the Hunter, that ad got so much free media, and was able to um, personalize Raphael Warnock because we were seeing all these terrible you know, attack ads, so many that you, I can't remember them, right? Just different clips of him saying things, either out of context or just short clips of him from the pulpit or whatever it might be. And then you'd see this ad of him walking around with this cute little dog, this, this little beagle um, <laughs> that I saw every day. <laughs> it's so weird thinking about that um, uh, in, a, in a strange quirk. And then he had this other ad too that was really smart at the beginning where he said, they're going to attack me for everything. You know, Raphael Warnock eats his pizza with, with, uh, with a fork and knife. <laughs> Raphael Warnock steps on cracks, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> and it's been done in other markets and other races, right? That's been a very successful ad. And so, you know, it's, it's happened, it's, but it's also worked. And so before Republicans could even kind of get their attack ads out, they spent seven figures uh, from the Warnock campaign putting that, like, hey, they're going to attack me over everything. This is who I am type ad. And it helped seed the ground and at least... Um, give people a baseline view of who he was. Because remember, in that first run-up, I mean, we knew who Rafa, there was, a, there was the, the first few months of that campaign, we all political, you know, in the political world thought that he was the front runner and knew that he would end up being the Democratic nominee. But um, he was, he'd go to these events and he'd be a virtually unknown. I mean, he'd go in South Georgia and the local sheriff or the local mayor would get a bigger crowd than he would. He'd have to go on their coattails, and it's hard to, you know, it's hard to reconcile with that now because he's such a, a national figure. But not that long before he had ran for election, he was virtually unknown in big parts of the state. Let me add one thing: um, in the stories you talk about when uh, the selection for Kelly Leffler was was being uh, determined. Uh, the, there are people in the book that some of you may know, and I ran across mm -hmm. a lot of names of people like, I know them, but I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And the, the story about Joel McElhannon, and yeah, about why, how, how Joel is connected to Kelly, and how Marty wasn't allowed to know that Joel was the one who recommended Kelly, and I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> You're going to have to buy the book, right? I mean, that was a good story, and I can't wait to see Joel yeah. and, 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 you know, tease him about it. And by the way, with, with the weird thing, you know, with, in, in, in traditional journalism, um, you write a story, and of course you check it and you fact check it, but it on, goes online, and, and if people say, you know, you, there, there's this minor issue or whatever, you can change it, right? You can go back and correct it or clarify it or something like that with an editor's note or however your publication works that out. But of course, in a book, you can't do that. So I made triple sure, especially with stories like this with Joel, that could alienate him from the governor for, for a very long time. Like, you're, you're, you're sure you're cool with this being in the book? Because 
because I value those those relationships, right? I'm not going to go burn someone um, like that, um, you know, if, if they said something that they didn't mean or if they went too far and, and had second thoughts about it. I could, like journalistically, I could, but I also know I'm in this for the long run too. And um, I'll be talking to Joel for years t from now, even though he might not be talking to Governor Kemp. <laughs> and I, I will add, I sent um, Greg an email that had at least six new titles, all based on the word flipped, that would apply. Flopped, flipped yeah. out. Uh, yes. You know. <laughs> Fluke. <laughs> yes. Flipped off. Flipped you know. off. <laughs> Anything can happen in Georgia politics, and I think the word flipped can be used. So you have a, you have a, you have a franchise now. <laughs> I think. One more question. Sorry. Oh, I think she, I think she oh. had a question. Oh, Katie. Katie okay. and then you. Okay. Thanks first. Go ahead, Katie. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Katie. I'm a first year public relations um, major. Um, I will also say that I do need to listen to and summarize politically Georgia after this or my boss will have my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now I can't speak for everyone, but I know that on campaigns that I've worked um, on, um, my the staff has always sometimes begrudgingly admired your journalistic independence. Um, so, you know, as a PR person, when you do get that call or that email from, you know, a press secretary or a comms director saying, hey, you know, I've got a story for you, how do you kind of decide, you know, what you run and what you don't and how you're going to spin it? Yeah, so it happens all the time, right? I mean, I'm at the blind pig, I got a really, I think, juicy tip that might be national news, but there's also ethical issues with, with that, so I don't know how that's going to go. But with, with that sort of story, I run it up at the flagpole. Like, like the, the tip I got at blind pig today, um, I have to go all the way up um, to like the, the, and I actually did, I, I, I slacked my, I slack messaged one of our top editors just saying, hey, FYI, I just want this on your radar because this is a hairy issue. Um, but generally, look, we have all these different outlets right now, right? Your typical journalist isn't just writing for the newspaper or, or, or the website. Um, right now there's, you know, the blogs, and I've, we've got a blog and a newsletter in the front, in the, in the print paper and the website and the podcast and, you know, all these different outlets. And so as I'm getting tips about stories, I look at different things I can do. You know, I, I might not be able to, someone gave me this great tip about um, the, a platform for a state house candidate. And I couldn't really write about that individually, but I can put that as part of a trend story later on and tuck it away. And so I've got a note file on my phone, wherever my phone is, here it is, that is um, it's really long and I, and I just keep different uh, threads in it. And you know, the, the, the curse of being a journalist is there's always more work to do. You always feel like it is not a nine to five job. You don't, when, at five o'clock or whenever you get home, um, it, the job isn't over. There's always something you can be doing, right? There's always that sort of, oh, I still haven't written that story that's been on my list for a long time. And I've got four of those right here that I, like, I've already done the reporting for and I just need to write. Um, so there's always that, but there's just different ways and you have, to, you have to kind of hone your news judgment. And frankly, you know, no one's news judgment is perfect. Stories that I think are kind of snoozes um, that I'm like, oh, I'll write it no matter what. Again, they're blowing up. And then stories that I think are, could be big don't get the same traction. And a, just an easy example of that is um, a guy who's running for Congress here <laughs> in, in the 10th District, Vernon Jones. Um, everyone at the Capitol two years ago knew that he was, you know, basically a Trump supporter, right? Even though he was a Democratic state lawmaker. And an intermediary called me um, probably around January or February of 2020. It was March. It was in the middle of the pandemic because I remember I was at home. Um, March or April and said, a Democratic state lawmaker is about to uh, endorse Trump. It's a huge story. And I said, when is Vernon going to do it? Like I knew it was Vernon, right? <laughs> and everyone at the Capitol knew it was Vernon. Um, but I still, I wrote the story. It's just kind of like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll write a short-ish story about it. And it blew up. I mean, like hundreds of thousands of eyeballs on that story and national news. And I said, okay, now I've got to juice up the story a little bit and add more context. Um, because the stories that, you know, maybe we're too close to because it's obvious to, you know, people in the political world is not to your average voter. Um, and I have to remind myself of that too because we are sometimes in a bubble and it's good to get out of that bubble as much as possible. Just to follow up on Vernon mm -hmm. Jones, this is an, a good example mm -hmm. as well of a story that doesn't seem to have blown up. The fact that he couldn't have voted for Trump in 2020 because he voted in the Democratic primary. Yeah, yeah, we reported that story um, a couple of days ago. And, um, and as a result, I wish I was kidding, on stage next to Donald Trump on Saturday, he called me Greg Butstein. Oh um, my God. <laughs> I, I swear. Um, and I'm just sitting there like, you have 
we talk about it in the podcast a little. My the podcast producers loved getting the audio, so it, he just he will play it now every so often. Greg Butstein, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a name I haven't been called since uh, probably even maybe even before kindergarten. Um, but no, there is a um, you know that that is a, a valid angle, um, and he hasn't really answered why um, why he as as a as someone who by then was endorsing Trump still was voting in the Democratic presidential primary. But that's politics right now. Um, that is Republican politics right now because the Trump divide is so sharp that just like we were talking about, it's not just camp, it's not just top of the ticket. Um, Trump is, is going way down into the state ballot to try to affect and reshape the state party. And the reason he's endorsing Trump, uh, Vernon Jones, and there's no secret, he even said it, was because Vernon Jones got out of the governor's race and is now switching to run to be your congresswoman, uh, congress member. Um, in a, in a very conservative district that you're in, right? This is not some swing district. Um, and so that's why when he got in that race, I wrote a story saying this, I know there's a lot of stories like this, but this might really be the biggest test of Trump's influence. If he can convince, if his endorsement alone can help a former Democratic CEO of DeKalb County, the bluest county in Georgia, the most important Democratic stronghold in Georgia, if he can win a district like the 10th that is overwhelmingly Republican against about a dozen other conservative lawmaker, uh, conservative would-be lawmakers, then then you know Trump's clout is still there, and the jury's still out on that one too. And and that race in particular, um, you know, it, that's a very safe Republican yeah. uh, district, but there's a lot of drama going yeah. on in there. In fact, you know, I, I had heard the other day that um, Trump was very angry that Jody Heiss had endorsed, uh, was it McGraw? Tim Barr, Tim Barr, sorry. There, there's so many of them, they're starting to they're blend all, right now. Yeah. And um, that they're, they're and, and had uh, escorted uh, Heiss's uh, campaign staff mm -hmm. out of an event because of it. And that one other um, campaign person had tried to get into a fight with another, I mean, it was like super oh, you, drama. You, that, you heard that one? Yes, um, did you hear, is it, is yeah, it, is it true? I haven't, I haven't gotten the police report of that one yet, so yes, I can't say whether that's it's true. right. Um, but, yes. um, but no, there's a lot. I mean, that, and th there's a lot of drama in these. In these, um, my, my sort of biggest introduction to that was the sixth district race back when John Ossoff was running uh, that special election in 2017, because there was so much attention and there was so much pressure on all the candidates, um, because that was seen as the first big test of the Donald Trump era, and it was right here in Georgia, and it was right in this 21 uh, a, a, a suburban district that Tom Price had won by 21 points, but that Trump had only won by a point and a half. And so it was seen as this new symbol of, of whether or not you know, Trump politics can prevail in the suburbs. And, it, and John Ossoff narrowly lost. I mean, it, it almost, he almost flipped that seat. And of course, Lucy McBath flipped it a year later. But in that race, there was so much behind the scenes drama. Um, people, campaigns poaching each other's staff and not paying their, their, their vendors and stealing each other's signs and all this stuff on the Republican side. I mean, it was brutal. And then meanwhile, John Ossoff really didn't face any well-known Democrat. And so he was able to consolidate um, Democratic support behind him pretty quickly. But trust me, there's a lot of behind the scenes fighting among Democrats too. And in the book, we talk about Stacey Evans um, and Stacey Abrams and how brutal there, there was times in that campaign that got really bad. And to me, the standout moment was when Stacey Evans was booed on stage at a um, Netroots, at a liberal um, progressive conference called Netroots. That where they boo everyone. They booed Bernie Sanders once at that thing. So it's, it's really rough. And she knew. She knew it was going to be a really tough audience. Um, but she got up there anyway and talked about her vision for Hope Scholarship and why she's running. And I, I, I was in the back of the room that it was a Saturday morning and I could, could not hear her. Um, when I look at the, when I re-looked at the video, I, you know, it was clear because she was talking to a mic. But there, you couldn't hear her. The boos were so loud. And to me, that was this kind of um, moment and Stacey Abrams was not directly behind it, and you know her campaign said she had no idea, um, you know about that and had no involvement. And in I remember her staff wasn't even there, um, but it was her supporters, and it just showed you know there are tensions. Sometimes the inter intra inter party inter party warfare is worse than the um, the typical partisanship because once it gets to the general election, it's easier as reporters too. It's just you know. It's red versus blue, it's their attack. But right now, there's so many different lines of attack coming. I mean, you know, we're seeing it in the Senate race right now. Republicans, Democrats aren't really attacking um, Herschel Walker right now. It's Republicans attacking Herschel Walker. It's Gary Black who's been out there on the forefront saying, you know, that Herschel Walker doesn't deserve to be um, 
the next U.S. senator. It's even now former SGA president at UGA, Latham Sadler, who's also been saying Herschel Walker should come out and debate, whereas Warnock, he, won't, he probably won't say a word until May 25th, until after the nomination, if Herschel Walker's the nominee. Question? Um, yeah, just um, I'm, I'm going to just announce I'm a pretty year opinion. Um, and I've been reading you for a long time, and I have your book in my car. But awesome. I haven't quite gotten around to it yet, but I will. I mean, obviously. Um, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, you told us about Warnock's dog. I got two quick questions. Yeah. One, what's the real reason Kent picked Leffler to be that sentence? I'd love to know. Yeah. Just among friends. We're not going to put it. <laughs> <laughs> gonna put it but there's got to be a story here. I mean, just, and then uh, the second question is, do you think there's any awareness on behalf of the former guy who comes into Georgia trying to drum up these crowds at whatever size they are? But yet, a lot of people think he might have helped them lose the Warnock and Ossoff race, that he ended up being a drag on the ticket, kept people home, hurt the party in that, and it was still razor thin. They could have won those races. I just wonder if there's any awareness on his part or his team's part. I don't know. I just, I just yeah. Look, I mean, you're right, and I'll take the second one first. Objectively, he did hurt the party, right? I mean, you can't make the argument he didn't. Um, and in the book, I talk about Kelly Leffler. Um, it got so bad that she had a, a, a spreadsheet her campaign had a spreadsheet of thousands of names of devoted, dedicated Republican voters who had voted for Kemp and who had voted for Trump in, in, in 2016 and in 2020 um, who were not going to vote no matter what because they, they believed in the lies that the election was rigged. And she called it, her campaign called it GOP not voting. I mean, that's how bad it got. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, this is not to take away anything from Democrats who did their own thing and mobilized their supporters and re-engaged and, and even outdid their turnout in some counties, in some small counties, which is astounding. But Republicans didn't do their part as well. Like they, they weren't able to energize those, those voters again, be, in part because of Trump and those lies about a rigged election. Um, I remember going to a rally early on in the runoff cycle with um, Vice President Mike Pence, and when he said something about it was a very valid point. He said, look, you know, th these elections are January 5th. A lot of you are going to be out on vacation for New Year's and for Christmas. So mail in your ballots now. Make sure you mail in ballots. And he got booed. <laughs> there were boos uh, because of the, um, that, that sort of the lie about uh, mail in ballot fraud had so deeply cemented, rooted itself among some Republicans. I went to a, a rally, a Stop the Steal rally that Lynn Wood spoke at and Vernon Jones spoke at. Um, and a cast of characters. Vernon was actually the moderate one there. I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Vernon was the one, because Lynn Wood was out there saying, don't even vote. Um, you know, th they were chanting, lock him up about Brian Kemp at that rally too. And Vernon was the one kind of saying, hey guys, you know, Republicans want to win the Senate back. Um, but I would interview voters afterwards and I would send, you know, there was this real frustration. I mean, these, some of these voters wanted to cast ballots for the Republicans, and they really believe they were not going to believe anything the AJC reported or anything that, you know, the mainstream media said. So nothing I could have said would help them. But um, they were saying, "I just don't feel comfortable voting. I just don't know what to do." And you know, you know, as a as an American citizen, I felt really bad, and and I kn also knew that you know I could scream until I lost my voice that the election's not rigged and you know your vote is counting but it wouldn't do anything she was watching newsmax or whatever the you know the the right wing media outlet of du jour was at the time and nothing i do would change that in terms of the real story behind brian kim and kelly Elfer, i go into it in, in great detail um yeah um but uh in the middle of the book i don't know um <laughs> but i go into also like the introduction of kelly leffler to donald trump because it didn't go well <laughs> at all. Um, Donald Trump thought that um, Brian Kemp hadn't made his final decision yet. And Kemp had, right? Kemp had already, I had already reported. It was on the front page of the AJC. Um, Kemp is expected to pick Kelly Leffler as, as his U.S. Senate nominee. Um, and a few days later, I, for whatever reason, Trump had in his mind that, that she was still kind of in a tryout. And, he, and, he, and Brian Kemp, Kelly Leffler, Nick Ayers, all go up, and Nick Ayers is a Republican operative, they all go up to Camp David and meet with, in a secret meeting with um, Donald Trump. And at first it started well, everyone was getting along. And um, 
I can't remember exactly what the phrase was, but basically Kemp said something to the effect of, and here's my pick, you know, and, and we can't wait for her to start working with you. Something to that effect as if, you know, indicating that he had made his mind up. And that's when Trump, you could kind of hear a record scratch. That's when Trump said, wait, what? It, it, it's a done deal? You because know, he wanted to feel like he had input in the decision. And Brian Kemp is, you know, look, Brian Kemp is stubborn. Like, you know, he, he uh, for those of, uh, there's a lot of people in Athens who, of course, grew up with him and know him uh, personally, right? Not as a politician. But this was his pick. You know, he wasn't, he could have played the game where he pretended that Trump had input and probably it might have turned out better. Um, but he was making clear that this was his pick and, and it is his pick, right? It's not the president's pick. It is the governor of Georgia's pick. He won the election. It's his pick. And that's how he felt. And um, that meeting went off the rails really quickly. And I kind of end that scene with Kelly Leffler um, tweeting, uh, uh, texting Joel McElhannon, the Athens operative who she's very close to, and saying, we better get ready for a primary challenge. You know, um, and that's exactly what happened. Trump never, there was always this sort of threat that Trump would endorse Doug Collins or at least say bad things about Kelly Leffler. And so the entire, the entire race, even in the runoffs, Kelly Leffler is sort of, um, on the precipice, right, is nervous. Her, her operatives are always nervous that one tweet from Trump would end everything. And it would have. And who knows that better than, than Brian Kemp? Because Brian Kemp got the tweet in 2018 that, that ended everything for Casey Cagle. He got the tweet six days before the runoff that, hey, I'm endorsing Brian Kemp, and he's the best guy ever. And it literally, you know, Brian was, Kemp was already ahead in the polls, but by single digits, that turned it into a double digit route. I, I would add, Casey Cagle is another really interesting um, uh, character in the book as a real person. I, I had no idea about his upbringing and how how difficult it was. You know, a lot of these politicians that we think about and who now are often very wealthy, yeah. they really came from nothing. And and the whole uh, Clay Tippins thing yeah. was a great part of the book. Too. Yeah, Casey Cagle wanted to play pro football, and you know, he got injured. Um, and, and couldn't fulfill that dream and, you know, and, and ended up becoming a very successful businessman and banker. Um, and the first Democratic state senator, I mean, sorry, first Republican state, he's gonna kill me if he hears I called him a Democrat. First Republican state senator from that part of Georgia, from Hall County, um, which of course now we know as this Republican stronghold, but the first GOP state senator from that part of Hall County in, since Reconstruction. Young, was the, the youngest state senator at the time um, and had been planning to run for governor for a decade. Right, like that was his goal. Um, he was lieutenant governor for, for multiple terms, but he wanted to be governor of Georgia and came in with all the advantages. Um, name recognition, lots of um, lobbyists and, and money backing him, um, big time endorsements. And even though Brian Kemp was also a Capitol insider, I mean, his office is across the Capitol Rotunda from Casey Kegel, Kemp was effectively able to brandish himself as the outsider, even though he wasn't, right? I mean, let's be honest. Um, Kemp, Kemp it was a capital denizen as well, but he brandished, he, he framed Casey Cagle as the outsider, I, I mean as the insider and himself as the outsider, and, um, and, and you know, and, and kept Casey Cagle under that 48%, uh, under the 50% mark to 48%, got into a runoff, and then the famous, well, I don't know how famous it is, but to me it was famous, the Clay Tippins tape, where t Clay Tippins was the, um, was the fourth place finisher in the Republican primary. Um, not fifth place, Michael, uh, Michael Williams was that. He was the guy with the <laughs> deportation bus that broke down <laughs> a couple days before the election. But Clay Tippins was kind of running this kind of interesting campaign where he was focusing on issues that you don't see Republicans in primaries focus on, like grade school education and beefing up technology. Not bad stuff, just stuff that doesn't really energize Republican voters. Um, and lost, you know, got in fourth place, and then went to Casey Cagle um, ostensibly to talk about endorsing him. And before he went to see Casey Cagle, he pulled out his phone, turned on the record button, tucked it into his, his jacket, and sat there with Casey Cagle without any aides or anyone else in the room for 90 minutes and recorded him secretly um, saying all sorts of things. Um, and among the things that he said, which was later leaked to me, and Richard Belcher at WSB, um, and it was kind of a campaign game changer was he said that he was backing these student scholarship tax credit sort of things, even though he knew it was a, I think he said effing, I think he said a, a bad word, but he said even though he knew it was a bad, a, a terrible idea, 
he was backing it to try to get a super PAC um, to, um, to, to not help one of his opponents. And up throughout the entire campaign, Governor Kemp's tagline was basically, he had a lot of taglines, but one of his main taglines was, um, I'm the same person behind closed doors as I am out in public, right? And then when to have his opponent being taped saying, I'm only doing this for political purposes, played exactly in, it, I mean, Kemp couldn't have framed it better. And of course, he did, had no idea when he came up with that tagline that this would happen. Um, but it played exactly into Governor Kemp's hands and helped him get ahead in the polls and if that hadn't happened, you wouldn't have seen Donald Trump endorse, because Donald Trump wasn't going to endorse a loser, right? And so he was up six or seven points in the polls. And if, this is even stranger, but it was Sonny Perdue who convinced Donald Trump to endorse. David was in the room, too. David Perdue was also involved, but it was Sonny Perdue who convinced um, Donald Trump to endorse Brian Kemp. And here we are today, as Sonny as the next chancellor of the higher education system, and David Perdue running against Brian Kemp. I mean... You know, there's a movie there. Well, Sonny Perdue, you know, there, he's in the book in a lot of places where he's giving advice or he's putting some, nominating someone to fill a position, which ends up being very beneficial to them, yeah. like, like our now Governor Kemp. And one moment I'll never forget happened here in Athens. I was at Governor Kemp's um, election watch party in, in 2018, and thankfully I had a hotel room somewhere around here because I knew it would be a late thing. I knew I wasn't driving home. And... It was closer than I think anyone really, you know, I think, let me put it this way, it was closer than Kim's campaign thought it would be. And um, we didn't know it would be 10 days of this weird purgatory um, until Stacey Abrams ended her campaign. But it was very close. And Sonny, walk, Sonny Perdue walks over to me and goes, Bluestein, call this damn thing, you know? <laughs> call the race. And we don't, at the AJC, we don't call races. We let the national outlets do that. The AP will call it or the New York Times or someone. Um, but I said, Governor, I can't do that, you know? Uh, he just, they felt like it was over. And I knew in the back of my mind, I was like, this is going to be a long, that was an all-nighter. I remember posting a story at 4 a.m. saying, 4 a.m. dispatch. <laughs> Here's why Stacey Abrams isn't conceding. Um, and we were prepared we were prepared for the same thing in 2020, and it happened, right? I mean, when Georgia actually flipped, it was a Thursday after the election. Was that Thursday? Friday morning. It was Friday morning after the election. And it happened in Clayton County, when Clayton County was going through their last batches of absentee ballots. And I wanted to go out there. I was like, it was 2 a.m. in the morning. I was like, I should probably drive out there, but it's also 2 a.m. in the morning. But I'm sitting there watching on Twitter one of my colleagues um, over there in Clayton County, a reporter there, um, uh, tweet out live updates, and we were like hinging on her tweets every couple minutes of like, okay, here this, because we knew Georgia was flipping, and you know, as someone who had covered Georgia politics now for two decades, I wanted to be awake, you know, and be able to report a story on it when it happened. Um, and so it happened at like 4 a.m. in the morning, and it was kind of poetic justice that it happened in Clayton County because um, that was John Lewis's home district, and it was a big part of John Lewis's um, district, and of course Donald Trump. Um, attacked that district right after, right, right after he elect, was elected president, but right before he took office. And it's called it crime infested and crime ridden and all these terrible names about the heart of Atlanta because it goes all through, from Clayton all through Atlanta. And, um, you know, I talked to activists and friends of John Lewis who said how much it meant to them that it was Clayton that kind of put Biden over the top and the, symbol, the symbolism behind that. Other questions? Oh, great. Um, we'll start in the back and then in the front. Hi, my name is Patrick Sheridan. Hey, Patrick. I'm a PhD student in history. Um, just wanted to ask you if maybe you could elaborate a little bit on like your process for writing. You know, were there like parts you really wanted to put in that you had to take out or something? You know, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a great question because there were right, and Professor Haynes alluded to it. Like, you know, there is a there is a operative at the beginning of the book where I know all his backstory, right? I know there's all the stuff that is would be good in a movie, right? But he was a minor player. And, um, you know, I think I only quote him once or twice. And he didn't even want to be quoted the once or twice. Uh, I made sure it was okay with him. Um, but, uh, you know, there are certain Republicans who don't believe Georgia flipped. So being in a book called Flip doesn't really help their, their, their street cred, right? So, um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's stuff, and there's gossip, you know, and, and it might be true, and there's inter, there's interpersonal things that were going on between, you know, different rival candidates and stuff like that, that maybe even I've reported in the Jolt newsletter or in the blog at different times as just like, you know, 
by the way, this is happening in the background. But I didn't feel like it should be in the book because I wanted to keep the book to what was happening, what, what, what I thought mattered, you know? And, you know, maybe other people, you know, I can't believe you didn't put X, Y, Z in the book, but I didn't, I tried to keep it to the main narrative of, of why Georgia flipped and about the people and personalities behind that and not, you know, why so-and-so really hated so-and-so because so-and-so didn't do this. Because they do, they, you know, again, Democrats hate each other almost as much as they hate Republicans and, and, and same as Republicans, right? Um, and unless it was pertinent, right? I mean, the tape was pertinent, right? Like, th that kind of backstory is pertinent, but unless it was pertinent, it didn't. Um, in terms of writing, I, after I sold the book in early January, I went and covered inauguration, freaked out that whole week <laughs> about how I'm gonna write a book, came back, had a really good discussion with my editor where he said, hey, you know, we, we have faith in you, go do your thing. Um, took off, I think, a week or two and just did a ton of interviews, just like, by then, people in the political world knew I was writing a book because I tweeted about it and it was out there publicly. Um, like one of those publication blogs or something reported on it. So I was able to say, hey, this is happening. Um, and I think Punchbowl News also reported it. So like it was out there in the general the political ecosystem. And so I started getting calls from people saying, I want to be in your book. <laughs> and I have a story to tell you. And some of them were good stories and some of them weren't. Um, and so I would just do, I, it was, it's exhausting to think about. I'd do 10 or 12 interviews a day of like 45 to an hour each. I mean, back to back to back. And then at the end of the day, before I would go to bed, I would, would make myself summarize each of those interviews um, and bold out the parts where I thought it was important. You know, because again, there was you know, two hour long interviews that might have gotten one line in the book or not, none in the book at all. Um, and then others that got a lot more. So I'd do a summary of it and then I'd work that, that bolded line into a part in the outline that I had a whole separate file of an outline. And again, I don't think this is the best process, it's just whatever I came up with. Um, so I'd have the interview itself, the summary of the interview, and then I'd work, before I'd go to bed at night, while it was still fresh in my mind, I'd have um, like the, the best part of the summary, and I'd work it into different parts of the outline. And then when I went to go write the outline, I could go back and say, oh, you know, this story about Warnock that I put into this section, and I'll go there. And then of course I had the, the, the book proposal, which was the roadmap, so I could, kind of work off that, but, uh, but for the book proposal, the runoff section was terrible because I didn't have an ending. <laughs> so I had to completely start from scratch on that part of it. Um, and then just continually, like I'm not a perfectionist, so just revising, revising, revising. I would like chug through one draft and, and like section one and just, my, my goal was to finish the first section by the end of February, right? And so I'd chug through that and then I go back to it in, in like April and say, oh God, um, why did I just, you know, I, I, you, my editor said I used the word cement like over and over again. He's like, I'm gonna never let you use the word cement again. And I made sure I took it out of, I think it only mentioned once in the book. So I had to go back and look at verbs I was using too much and things like that. Um, and cause I'm not, I'm used to writing a thousand word stories, right? You know, 800 or 1200 word stories and, and having to remind people who, read, certain characters are, and those things. I'm not used to having to do that. Everyone who's reading a newspaper article knows who Governor Kemp is. I don't have to say, you know, the governor of Georgia or something like that, but you have to do that in a book, and that was a whole different level for me. Or, descri or describe them. Or describe them. Yes, yeah. you know, that, that's always the toughest part. Yeah. I will tell you that I read your work every day from the AJC, and I could tell a real difference in style. I mean, this was a really well-crafted narrative. It really flowed. I mean, it was I mean, not, and he's not paying me more money. <laughs> I've already I really, paid her. I really am saying that. But I mean, to me, it seemed like you really, you know, took a very different way of writing. I don't know if it was like you had longer uh, time to do yeah. it, but I mean, I mean, you're a journalist. This was the work of a writer. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, infused with journalism throughout, right? Because it's well, the factual stuff, yeah. yes, it, and you know the the timeline, yes. But you really could capture these people in ways that I think in like long form journalism you may have some of that, but in your regular you yeah. know stories you don't get the ability to make all those connections. No, you don't. And I liked all the verbs, the verbs were, <laughs> and the adjectives too. I think George had a question. Yeah, what's up, George? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for talking about book, first off. Yeah. But uh, I guess what I kind of want to know is, like, with your interest in politics and government, obviously double majoring, like journalism, political science, and you spoke a little bit about why you became a journalist. Yeah. But, like, 
how did you discern, okay, I want to write about all of this stuff and summarize stories on this stuff rather than, like, not even be a politician, but get involved. Yeah. yeah, but be be a politician, like yeah. also be in government. How did you say, okay, I want to, because like it's very clear yeah. that you're very interested and very passionate about it in the same way like a politician or somebody right yeah. passionate about it. So how did you? Choose? That's a good question, and my wife will kill me, but she she challenged me with that. I was an intern at the AJC in, in 2003, and um, I was about to become the editor of the Red and Black, and it was the summer before I was editor of the Red and Black. And, um, and I remember we had, we, there was some sort of weekend, uh, the, like beach weekend or some sort of weekend with my friends down in Florida and I had to go a little later. And she was like, because of some story that was happening at the AJC. And I was an intern and I had to like, you know, it was very serious. And, um, and she goes, are you sure you wanna spend your, you know, spend all your time like writing about other people rather than doing it yourself? And that's like the question that cuts at journalists, right? Um, and I think my answer at the time was, yeah, because you know we are documenting for for you know an entire city, an entire region, what those people who who are changing changing the world, you know what what they're doing, and by doing so, we are also influencing. It. It's not our goal. Um, you know, I don't go out to say like I'm going to influence policy today, um, but by informing the public about that, you are, and nothing. You know, there's a chapter on the book about the pandemic, but but this isn't part. I mean, the, we every journalist became a science reporter in 2020. Even people like me who got twos in AP physics and AP chemistry and should never be anywhere close to covering um, science. Um, and it's be and I think that brought it home to me was that you know the stories we were writing about the government actions in the pandemic were were changing lives, and because they were affecting lives, because the governor was out there talking about closing down businesses and shuttering schools and limiting gatherings and like the world was changing and you know there was never there was never something that's so important that I've ever covered as like, those stories those press conferences even you know usually I'm used to a press conference like today where the governor signs a bill and it's a big deal um, but those were press conferences that changed you know the course of lives people were learning from those events and for the, from our coverage that they had to you know, shut down their businesses or their kids weren't going to school. And I think that whole kind of brought it home. You know, there, there's that tension. There is, right? Like, I could, you know, in a different world, have gone to, you know, get involved in politics in a different way. And I guess you still could, right? There's still an opportunity for that, but I don't want it. Um, but because but I, I like being, um, Galloway always said something really smart about the blog, which is it's where Republicans no, l go to learn about what Democrats are doing and what Democrats go to learn about what Republicans are doing. And there's very few people who can kind of stride both worlds, and journalists can do that, right? Journalists can go and, and be, you know, there is some bipartisanship at the state capitol, but it's not, you know, the ten tensions are hot all the time. Their p the candidates are always mad at each other and politicians are always mad at each other in some sense. And it's us, you know, who's in the middle. And then today, you know, I'm sitting there texting back and forth with both Kemp's campaign manager and David Perdue's campaign manager about various things and because they're not talking to each other, right? When someone wants to concede for office, um, when John Ossoff conceded to Karen Handel, like they called me for Karen Handel's number, right? Like we are in the, in the middle of that and it's a unique role. And um, I think that's how at least I, I, I internalize it. You're in every room where it's always happening, <laughs> guess, right? Yes. yes. Well, sad to say that one of the things that is happening right now is we have to wrap up this event, even though I know some of you have other questions. But the good news is Greg always comes back home and is always it around. Is it is home. And I know some of you had um, wanted to get your book signed since we have the author of this great book here. And if you didn't bring it or if you don't have one, they have some outside, and he did pay me for that. I did. No, yeah, totally. yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, one, we're so grateful that you are here, and I know that you'll be happy to spend a few more mo yes. moments. Um, so maybe while you're getting your book signed, if you still have a question, you could still ask it. But I wanted to thank everyone who was here today, and, and thank Spia and Grady and the Wilson Center for bringing this, this wonderful event uh, here today. I, I don't know about you, but... I enjoyed every minute of it, and, and you know, thank you for what you do, Greg. It is something that is very important, and we really appreciate it every day. Thank you. This really is my bar mitzvah. <laughs>